we generally find that they only teach them a certain part of the equation. So they're essentially assembly technicians. They're, they can build a really good, nice harness. But when it comes to giving them a blank canvas car, you'll find a lot of them don't actually have any experience in that area. Welcome to the HPA Tuned In Podcast. I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode, we've got Matt from Level Motorsport Wiring joining us. Now, Matt is an expert on motorsport or professional level motorsport wiring. He's based in the UK. I've been following him for a couple of years now on his Instagram, particularly because I absolutely love the level he's working to, the quality of the product he's punching out. As we talk about in this interview, uh, the sort of inspiration I get from following the likes of his Instagram account really help me to improve the quality of the work that I'm producing and make me try and strive to work at a higher level. In this episode, we chat with Matt about his background in mechanical work on cars and how he transitioned to auto electrical and then finally into starting his own business. His business is relatively new, it's two years old at this stage. So we talk about the challenges with starting that business, particularly under uh, COVID conditions and how it's grown over the last two years and how he intends to grow it further in the future from not only providing professional level motorsport wiring solutions but also uh, hardware products as well. As well as this we dive into the ins and outs of designing and constructing a harness, what concentric twisting is and the design process, what we actually need to think about when we are designing and documenting a harness that is going going to be constructed using the concentric twisting process. Of course there's also a number of little tips and tricks that Matt shares with us as we go through it. Now before we jump into our interview with Matt, for those who are fresh to the Tuned In podcast, High Performance Academy is an online training school. We specialise in teaching people how to design and build quality reliable wiring harnesses. We also cover topics including engine tuning, engine building, we cover race car setup, race driver education and even fabrication topics and we do this all with video based online courses that you can take from the comfort of your own home. Now relevant to our chat with Matt of course is our suite of wiring courses. This starts with our wiring fundamentals course which as its name suggests teaches you the fundamentals of automotive wiring and I know that a lot of people that are prepared to work on just about any element of their own project car build. Uh, tend to be a little bit put off or scared of getting involved with the wiring side of things. This course breaks down those barriers and makes it all a lot easier to understand. Once you've gone through that we have our two practical courses. We've got our practical club level construction course and our practical professional motorsport course. Our club level course as its name would suggest is for those who are building a more budget orientated but still very reliable harness for the likes of a modified street car or maybe a club level race car. The professional course will teach you those higher level topics such as how to work with auto sport connectors, how to concentrically twist your harness etc. Both of those courses include worked examples so you can actually see those skills being applied from start to finish. Both of our practical courses also include a step by step process because when you're faced with a harness construction job from scratch it can be a little bit daunting knowing what to do first first and what order to progress. By breaking the entire process down into a step by step process each of those individual steps is relatively quick and easy to complete and in no time by following that process from start to finish you've got a complete job, you've got it documented and planned properly, you're going to have the confidence that when it comes to power that harness up for the first time it's going to work exactly as you'd expect. Now as a podcast listener you can also use the coupon code PODCAST75 and that will get you $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course. I'll put a link to all of those courses in the show notes as well as that coupon code. Alright let's get into our interview now. All right, welcome to the podcast, Matt. Thanks for joining us today. Interested to find out a, a little bit more about your journey, your business level motorsport wiring and, and how you got involved. So let, let's start with exactly that. 
Yeah, so my background is probably not like anybody else's that would be starting in the motorsport wiring industries because I sort of came up just doing general mechanics. So I went through college doing like an MVQ level three to just repair vehicles, basically. So then started with dad's company. Then rather than actually working on cars, we moved on to doing diagnostics and like auto electrics. So that's sort of where my interest came for wiring because I realized how much I didn't want to work on cars. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's easier to keep your hands clean when you're wiring rather than uh, spinning spanners. It was more so uh, being on the computer a lot more than actual wiring because general or electrics for most modern stuff is all computer based now from what from what I was doing. But a lot of the um, electrics when you actually find the fault was really satisfying. So then that sort of was a slippery slope into actually wiring. In the mechanical trade, you know, as a mechanic working on, on cars coming in for repair work, how often were you actually seeing issues that weren't mechanical as such and actually related to wiring? And I'm talking here just, just factory cars, not necessarily modified cars. To be honest, it was about 50-50. Generally, you'd find that it'd either be a wire that had rubbed through or um, something had got into the wire and harness and caused a fault. Sometimes you'd have completely random manufacturer defects that would a wire would break randomly in the middle of a harness and you'd have to try and find it where it is and then fix it. Most of the time, it was just replacing parts, just replacing the, the faulty component. But uh, I'd say it was a bit 50-50, depending on whether it's mechanical or electrical. So at the point you said you've sort of got to the the slippery slope and and you're sort of heading more towards the the wiring side of things than the mechanical side of things. Was there any sort of uh, formal qualification or training that went along with that in terms of maybe uh, becoming a, an auto electrician or were you primarily self taught along this path? So I don't know how it works. Uh, in the rest of the world but in the UK we have what's called an NVQ which you go through college and there's three levels so level one and two is for general mechanics so level one would be like tire fitting uh, level two is for like fitting suspension parts and all that sort of stuff and then level three you do diagnostics and sort of get into like the wiring and all electric side um, so I went through that in college and then I had a basic idea um, coming out of college started with the family business and then decided that uh, I didn't want to work on the cars anymore. So I focused my effort on teaching myself more and more about the diagnostic side of things and how wiring and how electronics worked. And then that's where it gradually moved into that area rather than actually swinging spanners, so to speak. As you say, there's obviously a difference between how how these vocations are dealt with in different parts of the world. And I mean, one of the, the things that that I often see is a disconnect between uh, a qualified auto electrician, as we would call them here in New Zealand, uh, and someone doing what you do in professional motorsport wiring. And this is not to discredit uh, auto electricians, but you've sort of almost highlighted already that a, a lot of modern auto electricians' work is around diagnostics uh, and not usually with a digital voltmeter and actually getting down and, and deep in the wiring harness, but actually with, with a factory diagnostic tool. That's quite different to, to what you're doing, building these harnesses, correct? Yeah, exactly. So generally, when you say all electrician, uh, now these days, more focused on the fault on the computer and then just replacing the part that the fault says. And then they don't, most of the ones that I've seen don't actually go back if the fault is still there after you've replaced the fault, so to speak, faulty part, they don't generally want to go back and try and find the fault. This is where I had to learn differently that if there's a fault and it's still there after you've replaced the part, you've got to go back and actually test and see where uh, the, the actual fault lies. So uh, we actually had a, a saying that we ran around the garage was test, not guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think that really kind of separates the relatively small percent that that sort of go above and beyond and actually think through the entire process of what's going on and, and find the actual fault rather than just relying on a, on a checklist approach and, as you say, uh, replacing parts. So 
let's now that I've got probably half of the auto electricians listening offside with us, let's move move on. <laughs> and and the this sort of process of learning the ins and outs of motorsport wiring, there's not much in the way of formal qualification paths here. The at least when I got started, and I certainly don't work at your level, but when I got started, there was precious little information, precious little in the way of resources out there. So how how did you build up these skills and perfect them? So it, to be honest, it started when I, um, obviously it starts pretty much like everybody else where they buy a project car and they're like, okay, I want to, I want to do it myself. So that's what I did. I bought a project car and I was like, now I, this is where I want to go. So I want to learn how to do this. So just basically jumped in pretty much had a go. And, uh, I don't want to say when on the internet found it, but it was more, I'm more of a, like a practical learner. So I have to do it to be able to learn it. So it was more of a case of I'll just see a picture of how I want it to look and then I'll just figure out my own way of getting get to that point sort of thing. Yeah, sure. That, that, that makes sense. I, mean, I think that's probably how most of us sort of got our start. But I mean, talking about that start, if, if I relate this back to maybe my first experiences with the project car, it was wiring in uh, one of the early Link ECUs into... Uh, you know, locally it's a K70 DX Corolla where uh, we'd engine swapped in a silver top 20 valve 4 AGE and chucked a turbo on the side and it's a, a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, I I wasn't building uh, concentrically twisted harnesses at this stage, nicely sheathed with DR25 and terminated to Autosport connectors. This was... Yeah, you know, I'd cringe to look at. I'm glad that I I didn't have photos of of what I produced back then. I mean, is, is that sort of similar to your path of learning, or or did you dive straight in the deep end with the best of the best? Um, yeah, no, I sort of started with um the general like off the shelf automotive style stuff that you get like the automotive wire and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then just was trying to do the best I could with what I had, and then eventually it graduated to buying the best of the best and working out how everything went together. I'm interested to find, because I think there's a a relatively small percentage of people that do want to graduate and take that next leap like like you have. I mean, probably 98% of of those out there who are... a wiring up aftermarket ECUs or factory ECUs for that matter, probably sort of stick to the the club level or lower spec harnesses. And I mean, they, they probably do a, a great job, but they, they don't ever sort of strive to, to go further and, and build up those skills of professional level motorsport wiring. So what, what do you think was different about, about your approach that made you want to keep pushing, keep learning and, and get to the level you're at now? To be honest, I just, um, I wanted to do the best job I could. And obviously Instagram was probably a big factor in that because you'd be able, you'd go online, you'd see all the nice wire and harnesses from all the different companies. And uh, Joel from Racespec was quite a big factor in that, that uh, you'd see his posts regularly. And I'd be like, well, I want to do that one day. So it sort of inspired me to keep going and keep wanting to learn more and more about this industry and then how to get into it myself rather than stay working on normal cars. Yeah, I, I think you've just highlighted Joel has probably got, got a lot, lot to answer for there. My journey, not not too dissimilar. And for those who haven't heard of Joel and Ray Speck, he's been a previous guest on this podcast and uh, we'll drop a link in the show notes to his episode if you want to follow up with that. Uh, that episode was a great chat with Joel. Uh, but yeah, I mean, getting access to seeing people like yourself, like Joel and numerous others out there, uh, definitely for me, uh, it's a huge amount of inspiration and when you see that sort of work, I think, at least for me, and it sounds like the same for yourself, you, you're always striving to push and, and go that, that little bit further and, and get a, a better result than, than what you did last time. Right, let's let's move a little bit further into the wiring itself. And, I mean, particularly coming from your mechanical background, um, I'm interested, you know, are there any sort of key common issues you saw with wiring? I mean, it does sound like you're dealing mostly with production cars. I'm more interested in modified cars. I, I come from a, a dyno tuning background, so we saw all manner of issues. But is there anything that stands out for you as sort of key problem areas? To be honest, because we start from scratch, I don't generally see a lot of issues. But a lot of the time, if a car has come to me and there's an issue, it's generally because something is either being plugged in wrong or they've actually wired it backwards or they've not actually followed the pin out properly. 
So generally in the aftermarket world, um, they don't really see faults as much, but it's more just the way people have actually fitted something Yeah, is generally the problem. I mean, obviously there, a lot of that also comes down to a thorough understanding of the manufacturer's wiring diagram and understanding what they're actually asking for so that you can wire it properly in, in the first place. You know, I'll, I'll just relate one of the, the issues that I saw quite regularly uh, with cars that were coming to me to be dyno tuned and we'd put them on the dyno and, and find sensor faults or running faults or whatever it might have been. And one of the more common scenarios there was around earthing issues or grounding issues and people not really understanding how that should work, now, particularly uh, if we look at an aftermarket ECU, which is nice and easy because they supply us a wiring diagram, so it's pretty straightforward compared to reverse engineering a factory ECU. But we we generally have two types of, of ground or earth on the ECU. We've got a, a power ground and a sensor ground, and, and there's a little bit of confusion around how, how those should be utilised. So can you, can you talk to us about the difference between the two and, and how they do get wired? So yeah, um, a sensor ground is generally anything sensor related is the is the uh, specific ground for the sensor. So it's fil generally filtered through the ECU back to the um, main ground, which would be the pat. So it's filtered through the ECU and comes out the other side as normal ground, basically. A power ground is then the uh, either device or actuator or the uh, ECU ground, depending on how the pinout is. And the the key problem I see there is people running a, a sensor ground albeit it's not too common which is great but it does happen running the sensor ground to a cylinder head or engine block ground and, and that's not what we want it, as you mentioned there it, it's d designed for the sensor so what we're essentially doing there is creating like let's say we've got a, a manifold pressure sensor which will be a zero to five volt sensor and for the output from that sensor to be absolutely accurate and reliable we're relying on that regulated five volt and the sensor as a reference ground so if we haven't got that that reference ground accurate reliable repeatable then the output can float which in, in turn gives us an accurate sensor reading so those sensor grounds go to a specific pin on the sensor which leads into another problem i'm going a little bit deeper here but just seeing as we're on it probably worthwhile talking about it it, it may be that uh, a particular ecu has one or maybe two sensor zero volt supplies and likewise with the five volt but maybe we want to run five or, or six different sensors that rely on that sensor ground or sensor zero volt supply so how, how do we deal with that generally so if you've only got like one or two sensor grounds you can generally splice them out into multiple grounds so you'll either put the splice close to the ecu or in a transition in the harness depending on how you design the harness that's that's one way of being able to get one pin into like multiple like maybe 10 sensors or something like that in saying that, is there any sort of pros and cons on doing that splice right at the ECU header plug? That's that's generally where I've tried to do it versus doing it in a transition. Is there any sort of downsides in terms of reliability or serviceability in one versus the other? So if you do it at the ECU end, uh, generally you'll be able to get back to it if you want to add anything. Um, generally, if it's a sealed harness though, um, everything will be sealed so it doesn't really matter. But uh, obviously, if it's in the transition, it's going to be fully sealed and not serviceable unless you uh, reopen the harness. So unseal it. I would tend to try and stick them all. It, it depends on how we're designing the harness, but I would try to stick them at the ECU plug or like the uh, device plugs so like a PMU, PDM or a dash or something like that. And I guess the, the downside on that front, which as I say, that, that's the way I've generally tried to do it myself, but the downside with that is we're then running more conductors through the harness, which could become a problem maybe for the likes of a, a bulkhead connector where you're limited on your, your contact position, so you physically need to run more grounds through there versus doing the splice at the other side of the uh, bulkhead connector, correct? Yes, pretty much. Um, it depends on, so like I said, it depends on how you're designing the harness. So if we're doing a concentrically twisted harness, it's going to, uh, you want, you're going to want to plan out the twist. And obviously if you find that you haven't got enough wires to complete the, the twist, then you may want to add those wires in before, which would then be from the splice rather than adding filler wires in. So there's a lot of pre-planning that has to go into it. 
um, to know mm. how to, to design the harness. Okay, I mean, this is probably a good segue into talking about that term you've just used, concentric twisting. It's come up a couple of times already. And I'm going to guess that most of the people following this podcast have probably heard of that term before and, and have some understanding about it. But could we start with a maybe just a high-level view of what that term concentric twisting means in terms of the way a wiring harness is constructed? Yes, uh, concentric twisting generally means that um, you have the wires wrapped in a layer over uh, another layer or core that is opposite to each other. So each subsequent layer, the layer is is twisted in the opposite direction to the layer below. That's what you're saying? Yes, yes. As, as we step out, obviously the, the diameter of the, the harness is getting larger with each subsequent layer. So we're also stepping up the number of conductors in each subsequent layer. Yes. I just wanted to mention that uh, going back to the sensor ground and the power ground point, that uh, a lot of manufacturers differ on how they... Uh, word it in their pinouts and their diagrams so that's where a lot of people fall down that that is a good point i think it, even just in general the, there's always a bit of vocabulary difference between different manufacturers so getting familiar with the manufacturer's diagram reading their wiring instructions and, and having a, a good grounding uh, excuse the pun a good grounding on on how they intend you to wire that it's probably always a good place to start you know essentially read the damn manual right yes pretty much <laughs> read the instructions don't just jump in <laughs> As, as I was saying, obviously we don't have the benefit of of pictures here, but but at the end we'll we'll give you a, a link to Matt's uh, Instagram account, and uh, if you haven't seen concentric twisting, you'll you'll damn well see it there. So we don't need to dive too much further into that. As we step up in in these layers, the the conductor count uh, increases, and you know you've mentioned that term filler wire. So we actually, particularly when we get to that final layer of the concentric twist we actually have a, a specific number of conductors that needs to be in that layer. There's not really a lot of flexibility in that. So that's where filler wire comes in. What is it? Is it, is it just along for the ride? Pretty much. I don't generally know what the other people use as filler wire, but uh, from what I've seen and uh, what a lot of people use is just they just use the dead wire, so wire that's cut and not terminated at either end. Um, obviously, the, the right size to match what else is in that layer. Mm. There is something to be said whether um, it adds weight versus how it looks, but I prefer the way it looks as to how much weight it actually adds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this this gets into the, the usual objections we hear when we talk about concentric twisting. One, it's a waste of time. Two, uh, it's going to add weight, and, and that's really focused around the fact that in almost every instance, you're going to require some amount of, of filler wire, uh, and obviously that that wire is weight, albeit a small amount. So, I mean, yeah, I, I get those objections, um, but there are some significant advantages. So can you talk to us about the advantages with concentric twisting as you see them? Essentially, the main advantage is um, every wire is essentially the same length, so that if you were to bend the wire uh, 180 degrees or 90 degrees or essentially turn it into a, a coil, it's so like a coil cable, um, it will it will flex all that way and more and not put any strain on any of the conductors. Whereas if you put a harness with just straight runs, you would essentially strain either the inside or the outside wire when you bend that wire. I mean, that's something that can be easy to overlook, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And I mean, it's hard if, if if you haven't actually dealt with a concentrically twisted harness and, and actually grabbed a section of the main trunk of the harness and, and physically twisted or bent it backwards and forwards. I mean, the amount of flexibility in these is quite incredible. And part of this is because those individual layers of that concentric twist are essentially free to move relative to the other layers. So that that's what adds to this flexibility. And again, another rejection is like, okay, so what? Why does it need this flexibility? Well, I mean, when we're dealing with a, a very tight modern engine bay, uh, we don't have a lot of room. So so there is the benefit in being able to basically bend this harness through relatively tight 90 degrees to get around components and, and route the harness where it needs to be. So uh, the, there's there's some keys there that, that are, are pretty critical. Um, yes, granted, it is definitely not the only way to construct a harness, but uh, another benefit, which you haven't mentioned there, 
if, if we're using sheathing like DR25, which is kind of the go-to in, in a motorsport environment, uh, that's a, a heat shrink sheathing that's recovered down on our harness. Doesn't really work that well if we're just sort of parallel running our wires and bundling them together, correct? DR25 is all designed to be used with System 25, which is the um, entire uh, ecosystem of motorsport wiring, which is um, all the molded boots and the DR25 and the whole range of Raychem products, pretty much. So if you were to shrink the DR25 down over like a parallel twisted uh, harness, the chances of it actually... <laughs> uh, looking good? <laughs> looking good was one of them. Um, but when... It does actually, because uh, the parallel harness becomes so stiff, the, the DR25 yeah. will make it stiffer again. So you'll almost end up with like a, a stick rather than an actual harness you'd be able to actually put in a car. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a really good point. If Because the, the DR25, when it shrinks down, it sort of reduces the flexibility of that outer layer, which isn't an issue with a concentric twist. But yeah, when, when you've got a parallel twist, I mean, again, if, it, it's hard if you haven't actually done this test, but yeah. shrink that down. And first of all, it's probably going to look like a bag of walnuts. It's not usually that pretty and secondly yeah the, the flexibility goes away so uh, another thing which we haven't mentioned here is in, in general uh, with a concentric twist for a given conductor count you're going to end up with the smallest cross section of, of wire possible uh, and it's a circular cross section which again makes that uh, that easy to to shrink that dr25 down over now the, there's some other issues here, sort of getting into the the materials that you're using, this really sort of comes down to the motorsport environment, wiring environment. Uh, the, there's a few options we've got available in terms of wire and the really low end, something you might get from your average automotive supply store uh, would be copper wire with maybe a PVC insulation over the top. Uh, then we move up to uh, a more like a proper quality wire like TXL and then at the top of the heat for motorsport wiring we've got Tefsil. So can you talk to us about the differences between those three? Uh, could we build a concentrically twisted harness with cheap entry level PVC insulation or TXL or is it only for Tefsil and why? Yeah so um, essentially the differences between them is the normal automotive wire has got is generally the insulation is really thick um, and it's generally because it's PVC, it's generally not able to withstand any heat. Um, so you generally end up with a really small conductor and a massive insulation. Uh, and then you move up to sort of, we don't have the GXL, is it? Uh, GXL or, and TXL, but yeah, uh, they can be a little bit hard to source in some places. Yeah, we don't actually have that in the UK. We have uh, FLRY, FLIRT. Yeah, something like that, um, which is generally what like the OEM manufacturers would use. So it's a bit more um, robust than normal automotive wire, and the insulation is generally smaller. It's a bit closer to what you would use in a motorsport wiring environment, which is Tefsil or uh, Spec 55. Okay, so the Tefsil, again, smaller in the outside diameter insulation. That That's one of the key advantages. Yes, so Tefcel, the insulation is generally really thin, so it's almost the same size as a conductor. So overall, when you're using them in a, altogether in a concentrically twisted harness, you end up with a really small diameter harness, whereas if you were to use normal automotive wire, you'd end up with, with for the same amount of wires, you'd end up with a harness that's double the size of if you were using the smaller wire. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to also put in a couple of numbers here, and I'm, I'm hoping that from memory I'm getting these right. So that PVC insulation, it's definitely not something that I'd ever recommend we work with, even at a, a club level or entry level. I think the insulation is rated to something like 85 degrees C, which on face value, you know, the, those listening might be thinking, well, well, that's absolutely fine. We're never going to get anywhere near there. But you'd actually be quite surprised at the amount of heat that can be generated inside of an engine bay, particularly uh, after the engine's been run. It's it's absolutely hot, and then you come to a stop and you've got no airflow through the engine bay. And, and I've seen this a number of times, again, coming back to my, my dyno tuning days, the number of harnesses that were constructed out of low-quality PVC. And you know, externally, the harness would look okay, but 
you'd have intermittent faults and when you actually got into it, you'd find that there would be sections of harness where the insulation had kind of almost melted together and we're getting internal shorts and those can be so frustrating to find. So, all right, that that's out. Um, again, off the top of my head, I think the TXL that, that I referenced, something about 125C, uh, pretty good product and, and pretty well priced. And then again, off the top of my head, I think we jump up to Tesla, the insulation's rated around 150C. So a significant improvement. Yes, that sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I think is easy to overlook is if you want to start working with the likes of professional motorsport connectors, the likes of the autosport connectors that we see in these sorts of harnesses, we physically can't actually terminate the likes of PVC or even TXL to, to these autosport connectors, can we? No, so um, anything other than almost Spec 55 and Tefsel, um, the wire and the insulation is way too big for the contact and the seal in the connector. And generally, if you use all motor wire, the wire is almost um, too big to actually, some of the connectors are bigger than the wire. <laughs> Yeah, so and there's an ecosystem we need to be working with and, and more importantly understand. So if you want to, to step up to using these professional level products, then then that's going to be sort of driving the materials that you're going to use, which in turn uh, drives the tooling or uh, equipment that, that we need to use. So it's probably a good time to, to talk about this. I mean, obviously you're running a professional workshop here. Uh, you're building all manner of harnesses at this sort of level. So I, I'm I'm taking it that you've got a, a fair investment in in equipment, crimp tooling, etc. One of the questions we do quite often get asked for those who want to step up and maybe build their own, their own first uh, professional level harnesses, like what am I going to need? So could you maybe give us a, a rundown of some of the the sort of more common tooling that you will require to work with these these materials and, and con connectors? Generally, a really good pair of scissors uh, for if you're cutting the wire because um, the wire can be really tough to cut. Um, and then you need when you start working with all these materials, you need to start looking at what they actually require to be able to build the harness. So like a lot of the um, molded boots and the uh, heat shrink uh, will need to be abraded and stuff like that. So you, when you actually seal it down, so you need like uh, different files and uh, all this sort of like... Uh, Let, let's just back up there. So just for those who maybe weren't picking up what you're putting down there in terms of abrading the the, the product. So you're, you're talking about essentially roughing up the surface so you get a good key for the lights of the epoxy on your heat molded boots. Yes, essentially. So when you shrink down the molded boot, you abrade the outside of the DL25 under the boot and then you apply your epoxy around it and then seal it down and it gives it gives a non-shiny surface for it to stick to. Otherwise, essentially, it's not going to stick properly, correct? Yeah, the whole point of DR25 is nothing, nothing is supposed to stick to it. So you have to abrade it for something to stick to it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, e easy thing to, to overlook though. Yes. All right, let, let's carry on. So we're talking about some, maybe some files to to abrade that product. What, what else do we need? I would say if, if when you're starting out, you need to get yourself a, um, oh, I can't remember, it's an AMF8 um, and the turret for doing like the DTs and DTM connectors. They would be the major starting point because obviously DTs and DTMs are used pretty much everywhere throughout everything. So that's a DMC or Daniels Manufacturing Corporation sort of industry standard crimp tool in the turret that, that allows you to position the contacts when they're being crimped, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, and then moving on, depending on what wire you're using, you're going to need the proper strip tool for Tefsel or Spec 55 because a lot of the strip tools that are used for normal automotive wire will not work on Tefsel very well and will not leave a clean strip. Yeah, that Tesla insulation is incredibly tough to uh, cut through. I mean, it's, it, it's for a, a reason, obviously. And um, I, mean, I know a lot of people who are starting out, I hate to even say this, will be stripping the insulation off their normal PVC insulated wire with a pair of side cutters. And that that's just not going to cut it, uh, pun intended there, when we're working with the likes of Tefsil. I mean, yes, you, you may end up getting the insulation off the wire, but almost certainly you're going to end up uh, damaging or cutting through some of the conductor strands underneath, correct? So this is why we need the right the right 
uh, strip tooling to, to actually do the job and make sure that the conductors stay intact. Yes, essentially. So because it's so tough, it takes a, it takes a lot of strain to be able to get the uh, a lot of the normal automotive tools through the installation. So you need a nice sharp blade on the strip tool to be able to get through it. Um, so what's your go-to tool there? I, the Ideal uh, Ergo Elite is what I use just because they're really light in your hand and they're really easy to use rather than some of the other bigger ideal tools they are quite heavy and quite bulky. So when you've been doing it a lot, your hand starts to get, uh, you start to feel it in your hand. <laughs> yeah. Now, a- another aspect with this, just to, to dive a little bit deeper in, is, is strip length, which is really easy to overlook until you're kind of pretty deep in this. And particularly when you're dealing with uh, autosport contacts, uh, or DT, DTM for that matter, the, the strip length is quite important. We want to make sure that we've stripped enough insulation off the conductor that we've got full engagement inside of the contact that we're going to be crimping, and that, that ensures reliability. But we actually also need to leave a, a little bit of additional strip length as well. We don't want that insulation butted hard up against the back of the contact, do we? No, so when the wire moves, you don't want it to interact with the back of the contact. You want it to actually allow it to move so that it doesn't almost put strain on the conductors and like sort of leverage them out of the contact. One of the nice features, we, we use the Ideal Ergo Elite as well, and one of the nice features with that is you can get uh, or add to it an adjustable wire stop. And particularly, I mean, this, this might sound silly, but when we're potentially stripping wire off maybe 70 or 80 conductors for terminating an autosport connector, getting a consistent strip length every time is, is really difficult or impossible to do manually. So you know, do, do you rely on that wire stop as well for that sort of work? Oh, hundred percent is the the best thing that I've ever put on one of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mo- moving on. What what about the crimp tool? I mean, you've mentioned for the likes of the DT DTM. What about if we're dealing with auto sport connectors? Because that sort of steps up. And again, I I know that those who aren't familiar with that style of connector tend to to sort of get a little bit flustered and a little bit put off. There's a lot to understand in terms of crimp tooling positions, et cetera. So what do we need there? So yeah, you need the AMF8, but that's only the actual frame. You need a lot of positioners depending on what you're doing. So that's where you need to look at what connector you're using and what contacts that connector uses and then work that back on what positioner you need because they all work differently and position the contact in a different place. So that position, I mean, there's obviously a hint in its name, but it, it, it positions that contact so that when you 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 actually complete the crimp, that crimp is going to be located in the correct area of the particular contact. That that's what it's intended for. And, and again, just like the actual tool, there's there's a little bit of confusion or or concern about well, how do I know which particular positioner that I should be using with with a given contact? I mean, I'm guessing with the fact you're doing this day in and day out, you look at a, a contact and you, you're going to know off the top of your head which positioner uh, works with that. But uh, for those who, who don't have that level of knowledge, do, do we need to be guessing or is there a, a resource where uh, TE tell us what we need to know? Yeah, so you can actually download the um, uh, Autosport uh, Connector Manual and then it'll give you a list of all of the contacts that they use in their connectors and then it'll tell you all the part numbers of every positioner you need for each contact. Um, some of the part numbers will overlap because some contacts will use the same positioner. Now, also on the the back of that positioner, we'll have a, a guide for, uh, there's an a, a adjuster on the uh, DMC crimp tool, uh, essentially for, I guess in layman's terms, how how deep the crimp is completed. So uh, that'll guide us on, on what setting to use for a, a given wire gauge, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so is that sort of cover off our, our mainstream tooling that we're going to, to require? Or is there anything else that you wanted to add to that list? Now, probably we're going to need a good um, heat gun as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. So when you're working with the molded boots in particular, they need a lot of heat to be able to actually shrink them down properly. Um, DR25, you can generally get away with something not subpar. But uh, the molded boots is when you actually start needing to uh, get a proper heat gun and um, a proper nozzle that allows you to focus the heat on the certain areas that you're trying to shrink down. 
because they're not you don't just shrink it down like you do heat shrink you've got to be able to you've got to be able to focus the heat and shrink it down in stages yeah the other thing with those heat molded boots is we we require a little bit more control over the heat uh than you know your average sort of parts store heat gun is going to provide sort of a a, a low and a high level settings not going to cut it most of these uh heat guns at this level actually have a digital display and you can set the the temperature for recovery and, and that's really important so that you don't recover the boot too fast so you can actually manipulate it control it and position it as it's being recovered as well as you don't want it too hot so that you can end up potentially damaging the boot yeah essentially um they don't they don't burn so much they sort of um if you do overheat them they sort of ooze like a moisture and they sort of go shiny generally if they're shiny you know that they've been heated too much all right let's um let's come back a little bit and i want to to talk about the process of uh working with different connectors and yeah you know, i'm talking here about when we're dealing with with an engine obviously there's going to be uh, potentially factory sensors and actuators that are on it uh, that we may have to work with. We may have no option. Uh, then we may be adding some aftermarket sensors uh, to it, uh, maybe aftermarket injectors, etc., that have a, a known quantity in terms of the connector body. But, um, you know, some engines, it's very difficult to actually source new connector bodies and new contacts uh, to work with. So what are our options if we're in that situation? So generally, you have to, when, especially at this level, when you're trying to build a motorsport wiring harness, you have to think of what you're doing because the OEM contacts are not actually designed for this sort of level. They either don't have any way to uh, attach a boot to the back of them so that you can't actually seal them. So then it sort of is a bit pointless having a sealed harness and then having an unsealed connector sort of thing. Generally, if we don't want to use the OEM connector, we'll generally pot the uh, device or sensor and then add a fly lead to a like DT and ASL or AS connector or something like that. Okay. Depending on the type of harness we're doing. Can can you give us a little bit more um, insight into what actually goes into potting a, a, a factory sensor or actuator? Yeah. So when you pot the sensor, all you're essentially doing is you're attaching the wires directly to the pins inside the receptacle of the device or sensor, either by soldering them or occasionally you can actually get use the contacts, crimp the wire to the contact and slot the contact over the thing, depending on how deep the receptacle is. Um, and then essentially once you've done that, you fill it with epoxy so that it is fully sealed and resistant to any vibration or moisture or anything like that. Okay, and th this brings up uh, another sort of bone of contention when it comes to any conversation around motorsport wiring, which is the the age old debate of of solder versus crimping, and, and we might dive into this in a bit more detail. But you know, generally the the quick and dirty uh, conversation here goes that uh, we want to avoid uh, solder for all intents and purposes where possible in a motorsport environment due to its susceptibility to failure under vibration. Why is solder okay in this particular application for potting? What makes that different? Generally, because it's surrounded by the epoxy once you're finished, the vibration isn't generally so much of a problem then, so that you don't you don't generally have all the side effects of solder once you've done that. Okay, yeah, makes sense. So basically, that epoxy is is rigidly locating the the solder joint so that there's no chance of vibration affecting it and causing a reliability problem. When you are completing that that solder connection to the terminals, do we need to be a little bit mindful of maybe how much solder we're applying so that it doesn't wick too far up that flying lead? Because obviously, yeah. as soon as the solder wicks past the end of the epoxy, all bets are off, correct? Yeah, essentially. You, and once you create that hard point past the epoxy, you're pretty much screwed. Yeah. Okay. And uh, now an another element, though, I just want to talk about when it comes to choosing connectors is uh, that easy to overlook with a lot of the factory connectors. And if, even if we can source uh, connector bodies and terminals, and uh, as I mentioned, some engines that's very difficult. For a lot, that that's now quite easy to to do. Um, but 
What's easy to overlook with those factory connectors is often they are only rated for a reasonably uh, small number of insertions and removals because in a factory application we're, we're not expecting the engine to be coming out, the, the coils to be removed to check spark plugs at a frequent sort of you know interval whereas that does happen in a motorsport application. So you know, even if the, the sensor or the actuator or the connector or whatever is, is reliable in stock form over the life of a race car, that may prove to, to bring in some reliability problems. Whereas a, a lot of the aftermarket solutions we have, we've talked about DT and DTM, for example, uh, those are more reliable over multiple insertions and removals, correct? They're more designed around our motorsport usage. Yeah, that's correct. In terms of other options, there I, I, we've talked about DTM and DT, but uh, you know, obviously there's there's Autosport or Autosport Light, as you mentioned. Uh, are there other options that we can use there for for terminations? I mean, one of the considerations there is is, is the cost element. If you're looking to work with uh, Autosport connectors, and particularly if you want to pot maybe eight injectors and eight ignition coils and terminate those to individual autosport connectors, the cost of that harness is, is going to quickly escalate. So it's it's not going to be for everyone. Are there other alternatives there uh, outside of that sort of ecosystem of autosport and maybe DTM that you, you go to? Generally, no. We generally stick to the DTs and DTMs just because they're so reliable and the uh, parts are generally pretty available these days. Yeah. Um, don't really have another alternative if I'm honest. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, one of the questions that we quite often get asked is about the alternatives such as the weather pack connectors. Um, I've got my own opinions on these, but I'm interested to hear yours. Yeah, we um I've had some bad experiences with them, so I don't use them at all now. Yeah. Funnily enough, I uh, was installing a harness today with uh with one that I had no choice because it went into a device and um Turns out it just falls apart when you plug it in. Perfect. That's the ideal outcome, obviously, that we want with any connector. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think even aside from reliability, and I mean, it might sound like an irrelevant aspect, but uh, one of the things that I, I prefer with the, the likes of the DTM over the weather pack is you've got a physically smaller connector. And, and again, that might sound irrelevant, but once you start adding numerous connectors over, over a harness, that does start to add a lot of bulk to your harness. So trying to keep everything uh, nice and compact uh, is something I do strive for. Uh, another connector I, I might just bring up here, uh, I've, I've only seen these a couple of times. I've got one sitting in the workshop that I haven't used yet is the Autosport Composite uh, Connector. And I, I think if I, memory serves correct, these are actually designed for the Williams F1 team. And um, they're, they're sort of a, a much smaller alternative to the DTM connector, I think, six position from memory. Do you use those at all? Um, generally, no, because they're a bit pricey. And generally, when they get to that price point, you're just moving on to an ASL, ASX or something of that range. Yeah, I thought that might be the stumbling block because they don't really end up significantly cheaper than, than a proper uh, Autosport connector, do they? No, um, and generally you don't really find the need for them. And if you're going to need, if you need them, and at that price, you just may as well put a an AS connector on it. All right, I just want to follow on the the conversation there about about solder, and obviously we've talked about its use in potting. And it's very difficult because any time we, we bring up the conversation of solder, the, the normal objection we get is a, a bunch of people will come in and say, well, I soldered a wire back on my harness 15 years ago and it hasn't fallen to pieces, so obviously solder's fine. And you know, granted, we're not saying that every solder joint is going to instantly fail as you drive out of pit lane. That, that's obviously ludicrous. There are also some connectors that do still require solder, correct? that basically you're, you're enforced to, to use solder because there are no options? I would say yes and no. A lot of the time, the connectors that have solder bucket type terminals, you can actually buy a normal version of it. Okay. Generally, I, um, yeah, a lot of the time, I've, in my experience, I've not really found anything that you can't get a normal crimp version of. Um, some of the like Lemo type connectors, you can't, depending on the series, but uh, we generally don't use anything like that. If you are forced to use solder for any particular connector are there any sort of steps we can take to 
ensure it's going to be as reliable as possible and ensure it's going to live a long and healthy life in a motorsport environment? Um, just good heat management and making sure that the same as sort of welding where everything is nice and clean and crisp and it doesn't have any porosity or uh, contamination while you're soldering. Sure. I mean, a- a- another advantage kind of in line with the potting, if if we can, if we are in a position where we can do as much as we can to also uh, reduce any relative movement between the wiring harness and, and where that solder joint is, because that's going to be the failure point. So you know, minimizing or supporting the, the solder joint as, as well as we can mechanically as well, I think uh, that that's a, a key advantage, I think, a- along with getting the best reliability we can. Now, I'm interested to to talk about the process that you go through when it comes to designing and building uh, a wiring harness for a particular job. So, you know, uh, I think it's really easy to sort of get excited and want to jump in with a, a few spools of wire, or some side cutters and uh, the wire strippers and, and just physically start making the harness. But uh, there's a bit that goes on before you get to that point, correct? Yeah, so I actually learned this the hard way that um, planning and documentation is pretty much everything to a uh, proper wire and harness because um, if you don't have that in place, it's essentially useless. Um, you need to you need to actually plan every step of the way out before you actually cut a wire to ensure that you're actually doing a good job. So does the start initially with a consult with the customer in terms of their intentions you know, planning out the the hardware that's going to go into the harness, location, etc., before you can sort of actually start designing the harness around that? Yeah, so it depends on what stage the customer comes to me, but generally they'll come and ask for me to get involved with the project and then they'll sort of ask uh, advice on what sort of hardware they they should use. Um, I can, I'll generally put them on to, they need to work out like an IO list beforehand so that we need to get that nailed down before we can even look at what hardware is available for that project. So one thing uh, we come up against a lot is the PDM inputs and outputs. Um, with a lot of cars these days, there's a lot going on. So generally any small PDMs like a PMU-16 or a, a Haltech PD-16 and stuff like that, 16 outputs becomes a problem very quickly on most cars. So we need to sit down, plan out all of the IO, exactly what we're going to do beforehand before we purchase anything yeah and then work backwards sort of thing i I think that's a a mistake i see a lot of people fall into is sort of jumping into buying a a piece of hardware because they've seen a good review of it or a mate's used it or you know they've seen it on someone's instagram account and and then uh, unfortunately realize a, a little bit further down the track that that particular product isn't well suited to their application and as you mentioned uh, enough IO inputs and outputs to to run an engine or in the case of a PDM to actually be able to power uh, the different circuits you need to operate that's obviously the the key place to to sort of get started in terms of your documentation itself uh, are you using any specific software for doing so i mean at the high level i know there's software like hardware from te um yeah tell, tell us about your solution so yeah we actually just use excel because it's very simple easy to use and pretty much everybody has access to it one of the problems with like the higher level softwares is generally you have to export the program or the file as like a pdf and you can't edit that later on so if you give that to a customer and they want to like make a change or suggest something they can't put their feedback onto it so what we do is generally build everything in an excel spreadsheet then converse back and forth with the customer uh, on where whether things need to be different or whether they're okay with it or whatnot and then work out we'll go we'll spend probably a week or so working back and forth to make sure everything is perfect in terms of the the projects you're working with Do they all come into your shop or are you working on some remotely where you never actually get to see the vehicle? I I do it both ways. Um, I generally find that um, if they come to me and I have it in front of me, I can do a better job than remotely because um, having to rely on the customer for designing, sort of designing the harness and doing the layout diagrams and stuff like that can be a bit of a pain in the ass. So we don't, um, I tend to say nine times out of 10, you have to bring the car to me. Yeah, okay. In terms of you know going from where the hardware is located to to sort of working out 
the routing and branching points for the harness. Uh, what are you? What are your solutions there? How are you actually sort of playing with different design layouts and branching and routing, etc.? Yeah, so I I try to keep everything as clean as possible. So essentially, we try and make sure that the route in routes everywhere it needs to go as clean as possible. So whereas on a lot of motorsport harnesses, you'll see that the, uh, a molded boot transition has uh, two ends where the wire exits. So you'll have like the, the main trunk going in one end and then all the wires break out of the other end. We tend to try and stick with all the wires breaking out of the one end rather than having a big bundle or breaking out of both ends. It just looks a bit messy. So we try to make everything as neat as possible and have as little spurs off of a breakout as we can. Sure. In terms of actually laying that out in the car before you you sort of add that to your documentation, though, I mean, personally, I I use something like nylon rope just to sort of get me a sense of of where I could run the harness. It it kind of has the same bend radius as the harness. We can get it in the same diameter. So I find that quite an easy way to visualize what my options are. Are you using anything like that? So uh, generally, if it's a really tight space, I'll generally use some rope to simulate the harness to make sure that I can actually run it in that um, area. But a lot of the time, what I do is I map out all my breakout points with tape and a pen. So I put like a line and then that's where the center of my breakout is. And then I work between those points. Um, It's just, it works a lot easier and a lot quicker for me, but it's probably not for everybody. I would say that if you're just getting into it, you probably want to start making a rope harness first. So you, you have a visual representation of what you're trying to build. Sure. I mean, we need to appreciate you've been in this uh, business for a while and uh, you're probably operating at a, at a higher level than, than most listening to this podcast. Now, just coming back a little bit to the design and planning and particularly how it relates to a concentrically twisted harness, because there's some complexities here as well. I mean, it, it's hard enough to, to make a concentrically twisted harness for your first time, but we also need to plan ahead in so much as if we get to that first breakout point and we find that we've got a sensor that requires two conductors from the outside layer and one from the very center, I mean, yes, that's possible, but it's not really ideal, is it? So how how are you considering where these breakouts are versus how you design that layup? So it's actually, um, it's actually pretty difficult, especially when you have a lot of different um, size wires in the layup. A lot of the time, um, what we'll try and do from the start point, it, it goes back to how we design the harness as well. So depending on what we've got to break out where, if we have, um, say you have the ECU as a start point and then you, you move out to the first breakout and there's a sensor off that breakout and the rest just go to the next breakout, we'll try and put that sensor in that top layer so that it literally comes off of that layer smoothly into that breakout transition rather than having it having to break down the entire construction to find it from the middle and pull it up through. So these are the little things that they require a lot more thought at the outset but are going to make for much smoother sailing and a much faster construction as you actually get stuck in. Yeah, another thing to mention, especially when using autosport connectors and stuff like that, is a lot of the autosport connectors don't actually have very high pin density for larger pins. So when you're putting a high current device like a fuel pump through an autosport connector, um, you'll find that if you want to actually run a lot of stuff through it, not just a fuel pump, you need to move to a higher density connector, which generally is only around size 22, 20. AWG. So what you'll need to do is split the bigger conductor over multiple pins to allow you to transfer that higher current through the smaller pins. Yeah, I think I think that's something that's really easy to sort of not get your head around is that we don't, if we're running a 16 gauge conductor for a particular output to support the current, well, we don't have to run that 16 gauge through the auto sport connector, the bulky connector. We can break that down. And and that really just comes down to understanding the current handling capability of the particular contact. I mean, again, off the top of my head, I think we're dealing with 22 gauge, we're, we're somewhere around about six amp maximum for that contact. Does that sound about right? Uh, for the 22 is about four, uh, 22 is about 5.3, if I remember rightly, something around there. I'm rounding up. We're close enough. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, understanding that current handling capability and, and then, you know, if you need to obviously run 15 amps through that, we'll three fives of 15 so we're we're there with with three contacts so so that's you know 
some of the things we can do to not necessarily run the particular contact size that on face value you'd think that you'd need. And on that same note as well, let, let's talk a little bit about some of the complexities around uh, the likes of shielded cable. So generally if we're talking about the likes of engine speed and position or maybe knock sensors, uh, we're going to run a, a shielded cable where our conductors are in the centre, there's a, a braid, a shield braid around them and then there's, there's a hard insulator around the outside of that. And that that, uh, that braid, that shield is there to protect the conductors from electrical noise being uh, introduced into the actual conductors. We don't want that. Uh, this brings us to a complexity around how we're going to get the the termination through an auto sport connector. So can you talk to us about how that works? Yes, yeah, so there's essentially there's two ways you can do it. Uh, it just depends on how fussy you want to be. Um, you can essentially turn the, uh, depend on, so if you start a DCU and go to the bulkhead connector, you can turn that one section into one shielded portion and then the next section from the bulkhead to, say, the engine into another shielded portion and run the drain back to the ground point. Or you can actually um, pass the shield through the autosport connector, rejoin it to the shield on the other side and then run it back to the ECU ground. Okay, so if we're doing that, we're running that shield through, which is generally sort of the way I, I try and do it. Um, we've got a like a, a braid, which which is going to be difficult to terminate into a, an autosport contact. So, you know, what, what what materials are we using in order to allow us to do that? Yeah, so we actually use a sol uh, what's called a solder sleeve. So um, essentially, you strip back the insulation covering the braid, slide the solder sleeve over, which has a, some of them have like a wire tail that is attached, or you can actually add your own wire tail for the shield, um, which then you do that, you then shrink that down, and then that flows the solder around the uh, uh, over braid and attaches that uh, piece of wire to the screen for then you to pass through. So we're getting that electrical con contact or conduction there between the drain wire that's added into that solder sleeve and the outside of that braid. And and I'll just dive into this because obviously we've mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, again, we're, we've got solder. So the, the the reason why this is effective here is, is, is twofold. One, this is a product designed for a very specific task and it has a measured quantity of solder there. So we're not getting excessive amounts of solder added so we don't have that wicking effect. The other thing is that these solder sleeves, when they are heat recovered down, they become essentially pretty rigid so that removes the problems that we have with uh, vibration related failures. So, so that's why that's a, a proven way. So at that point you've got your internal conductors which we can obviously terminate straight to an autosport contact. Then we've got this additional drain wire, we, we terminate that. That gets us into one side of the autosport connector and basically we repeat that process on the other side, job done? Yes, essentially. One thing to mention is the um, solder sleeve should only generally be located inside of a moulded boot. So generally at the end of an autosport connector, you have a uh, moulded boot at the end, which then gives that the strain relief and the rigidity that it's not going to have a uh, vibration related failure. Yeah, it, it, it's just multiple steps in in this process to help uh, give that solder or basically all of those contacts for that matter uh, the best chance possible. It also comes into uh, strain relief or service loops as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about what those are and why those are important? Yeah, so essentially the service loops are little loops at the back of uh, like an autosport connector or um, any sealed connector really that allow you to sort of two reasons they give you strain relief if you're pulling on the end of the what if you're pulling on the wire or flexing it uh, and the, the connector is at a solid point so like a bulkhead um, and also when if there is a failure or um, you need to change something later on so for serviceability it gives you that little bit extra wire to be able to cut it and re rejoin it without having to depin the connector and add your own wire in again yeah, this, this is one of the problems with these sealed uh, harnesses is that there isn't a lot of flexibility in terms of adding, modifying or, or uh, repairing. So that, that service loop gives you that, that little bit of a chance to sort of recover the harness if, if something's wrong without needing to essentially start from scratch, correct? Yeah, that's pretty much it. 
Okay, we've we've gone off on a bit of a tangent because we were really sort of talking about your your construction process, and we've got a, a little bit down in the weeds with some of the specifics, which is absolutely fine. But let's get get back to our task here. So we've sort of gone through uh, the design and documentation phase. So you actually had a point where uh, you can start constructing that harness. Before we do that, just just on that note, that essentially a sealed harness, we, we've really got no potential to modify or add to it. Um, th- this might not be a sort of a, a might be a case of it depends on the application and the customer. But do you try and do anything around future proofing uh, in terms of adding maybe a breakout with some more I/O on it if that's available on the particular ECU? Yeah. So essentially, if we haven't maxed out the I/O already for the hardware, we'll try and terminate and add all of the extra I/O and any additional five volt sensor ground. 12 volt ground into the harness so that essentially we're making it a bit modular where you can just plug another harness in to do what you want to do rather than sending the entire harness back and remaking it or modifying it yeah that that would become a very costly exercise so just those small additions which at the time of design and construction isn't going to actually add a lot of work but could save you a, a huge amount of frustration further down the track now let's get into the the actual construction process uh, I'm interested in terms of, obviously it, it's very dependent on the specifics of a harness uh, in terms of how complex it is, uh, how how much I.O. it's got, et cetera. But I mean, can you give us maybe some some ballpark numbers on in terms of how long it would take you for the actual construction process of an average harness? Um, yeah, sort of, because it, it depends on an average harness could be like an engine harness, could be like a rear harness or it could be a main chassis harness so it generally really depends on what the harness is but Let, let's break it down and make it real easy and call it a, an engine harness yeah. so that we've got a real good idea of what we're talking about yeah so an engine harness uh starting from a bulkhead going out to the engine um so just that one section you probably have about three days to four days worth of work in that harness um, which my maths is terrible, but uh, equates to probably about 30 to 40, 50 hours. Okay, okay. Now, in terms of the time that you've spent leading up to this point on the planning and the documentation, what sort of time's gone into that segment of it? We generally spend about a week and a half just planning out the harness, working back and forth with the customer and working out how actually everything works, the pinouts, the uh the way we actually want to do things and what connectors we're going to use and what bulkhead connectors we're going to use and how we're going to pass through them and stuff like that um it's a lot more time i would say goes into the planning than actual construction yeah i'm glad you said that um because i was hoping that was going to be the answer that seems to be how my ones go uh but yeah i think that's really important for those listening to to just go back and and really dive into you know you've got probably double the amount of time going into the planning and documentation than the actual construction. And that might seem uh, a little bit uh, sort of top heavy, but again, it comes down to the, the time spent planning thoroughly is going to actually make the construction job go that much quicker. And just as importantly, it's going to help avoid any potential mistakes or, or oversight. So can't stress enough just how important that that planning stage and documentation becomes. Now, when you've got to the end of the construction, do you do any in-house validation and, and testing to confirm everything is exactly as expected? I mean, you know, the best best laid plans still, you know, we're human, we can end up making mistakes or errors. Uh, these auto sport connectors are small. It, it's very easy if you're not super attentive to get uh, maybe a contact in the wrong position every now and then. How do you deal with that? So we're not, unfortunately, we're not actually at the level where we would use a, like a higher end Cirrus HiPot tester yet, but we do all of our testing um, with a multimeter doing pin to pin testing, obviously referring back to our documentation to make sure everything is in the right place where we specified it should be. We actually do, especially on the auto sport connectors and a lot of the um, DTs and DTMs, we actually do a, like a contact retention test as well to make sure that everything is seated and isn't going to push back once you plug it in. Sure. Uh, for those who haven't heard of that term, hypot tester, could, could you give us a, a really quick rundown on what that is and where the advantages lie with that product? Yeah, so essentially the, the hypot tester, uh, you plug the harness in from both ends and it basically runs through a pre-configured program testing every single individual circuit 
for continuity, uh, insulation and resistance. So it goes a little bit deeper than what we can do just with a continuity test with a multimeter in terms of it's actually able to uh, isolate and figure out if there's an internal breakdown in insulation between uh, conductors, correct? Yeah, that's right. So if you have like a nick in the insulation, it can essentially tell if there's a, a leak. Yeah, I mean, I think we're probably understanding that, yes, it, it goes a little bit deeper and you know, will potentially uncover maybe something that could cause an issue down the track that, that is a little bit harder to test with the multimeter. But obviously there's an entry entry price problem with that product um, and it's definitely not for, for everyone. And I mean, it does also, because it requires essentially adapter harnesses uh, to go from the, the HyPot tester to the harness that you want to test. Yes. Uh, so it, it really lends itself more to production style runs where you're doing multiples of the same harness as opposed to one-offs, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So essentially, when you buy one of those testers, you need to have all of the adapters pre-made so that you can plug them into your harness. And it's not just one end, you need to have both ends. So you need to essentially, especially if you're doing a lot of OEM connectors, you need to have the uh, either female or male receptacle end for your harness to be able to test that circuit. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, once you've done that, uh, the product's ready to, to ship out to the customer or install on the vehicle. Are you doing any of the actual uh, configuration and setup as well, or are you just leaving that to your customer? Um, yeah, so we do display and PDM setup. We generally leave all of the calibration and ECU stuff to an outside source, depending on whether the customer's already got one or whether we recommend someone. We don't, yeah, we don't generally touch anything ECU related. Yeah, in terms of product, I'm interested to talk a little bit about what uh, what you're using there. I mean, obviously, the, there's a, a, a huge array now of different ECUs, PDM, PMUs out there, keypads, etc. What have you sort of settled on as your go-to products and, and why have you gone in that direction? So a lot of my customer base at the minute seems to be revolving around the ECU master products. To be fair, I do like them quite a lot. All of their products are really good value for money. The only downside is the IO on their PMU16 is quite small, uh, like we've talked about before, where it will get filled up really quickly. But generally, the features you get for the EC Master product range is some of the best on the market for the money. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. We actually run uh, two PMU16s uh, in our Toyota 86 uh, endurance car. And I've, I've used a, a number of different manufacturers, PDMs over my time. And the PMU16 is very feature rich. It's got a lot of functionality that, that we don't see on much more expensive products, uh, such as the fact that you can pulse width modulate outputs. Uh, so yeah, I 100% I agree. The fact that I've just said we're running two PMU16s, it, it kind of comes back to your point there. This is a f fairly stripped out race car and we still require two of these PMUs. But there's some advantages in that as well sometimes. While we aren't personally doing this, quite often what we see is one PDM PMU will be fitted at the front of the car for the likes of uh, ECU and engine functionality, and then uh, maybe there'll be a second one fitted at the, the rear of the car for the likes of uh, fuel pumps, uh, diff pumps, et cetera. So the, there's the ability to, to split your weight and, and basically everything's communicating via CAN, so it makes everything nice and flexible. The other thing, that I really like with the EC Master product is the flexibility of the CAN bus messaging, which means that you're not locked down to one manufacturer's product. Uh, it's essentially got its own built-in CAN sniffer as well. So really easy when you're decoding messages from a different manufacturer's ECU or maybe you're sending messaging to a dash, uh, you can you can really lock down and know that uh, what you're seeing is, is absolutely correct and everything is working as you intend before you sort of uh, go too much further. How about the ECU side of things? Is that sort of an ECU master go-to as well? Um, funnily enough, no, we don't, because uh, we don't really do a lot with the ECU side of things. We generally let like the outside source uh, either recommend or uh, supply their own, whatever they're comfortable with, because we generally find that whatever the tuner is comfortable is with, they give the best results. So generally, if we if we do recommend it, it'll be we we'll can recommend a higher end ECU that we know is capable and will work. So like a Cyvex, a Motec or a Life Racing ECU, um, just depending on the customer's budget. Um, a lot of the time we find that the 
ECU master ECU is actually the IO isn't good enough for a lot of the builds that we're doing. Yeah, we found exactly the same. We, we've got a couple of worked examples on the EC Master EMU Black and uh, when we installed one of those in our version 11 Subaru STI, uh, we were too limited on I.O. in terms of that particular product. We couldn't control all four cams, for example. But yeah, you know, it's obviously horses for courses uh, and again comes back to our conversation earlier about making sure that the I.O. that you want matches the product that you are selecting. Uh, I'm interested... Obviously, every ECU has its own little quirks and nuances with the the wiring and we kind of already talked about the different terminology that manufacturers use with their wiring diagrams. Is it a problem for you if someone brings you an ECU that you've just never dealt with before and you've got to sort of start from scratch with that learning curve or is it all just part of the, the process? Um, generally, if there's reliable documentation for it, we haven't got a problem working with anything. A lot of the time you will find that it sort of isn't worth building a harness to this sort of level for some of the older style ECUs because chances are they're going to need swapping out in a couple of years and the harness is going to outlast the ECU. Now, one question, I should have covered this back earlier when we were talking about products uh, and consumables that we're using. It's come up already, the heat moulded boots. I just want to sort of circle back to the heat moulded boots and, and these can be used for sealing the likes of the back of Autosport connectors. Now with the popularity of the uh, Super Seal connectors that we see on a lot of uh, aftermarket ECUs, there's back shells to allow us to adapt those connectors to a uh, heat moulded boot as well. And then we can use them for transitions inside of the harness. Now, when it comes to selecting these boots, there's there's quite a lot to understand here. Uh, one of the the things we need to to look at is physically what the uh, the recovered size of the boot is going to be, and making sure that that's compatible with the outside diameter of our harness or the connector. In other words, making sure that it can physically shrink down sufficiently. But then there's other elements. There's some of the connect uh, some of the heat molded boots are lipped or straight. Uh, they are glue lined or or non glue lined. Can you talk to us about why we would use uh, glue lined? versus non-glue lined, lipped versus non-lipped boots? Yeah, glue line versus non-glue line. I generally don't use the glue line ones just because they're a bit more difficult to work with. If you're doing a production style harness, it's just easier to have the glue already in there and shrink it all down and you're good to go rather than putting that extra time in and having to glue it yourself. So like the, the non-glue lined ones, you'd have to shrink it down and then as you're shrinking it down, abrade the heat shrink and the inside of the boot and then apply the epoxy and then uh, finish shrinking it down. The, the, that sounds like a, a messier process and I've gone through this and made a mess so I'm speaking from first hand experience here, uh, physically adding uh, epoxy to, to these boots. I mean I, I use a, a little syringe to do so but it, it can end up being a, a bit of a messy process but you still prefer that to using the pre-glued boots? Yeah I find that the pre-glued boots um, Either the, depending on how fast you're trying to shrink the boot down, the glue can actually harden before you've shrunk the boot down sometimes. And sometimes the glue will uh, will be too much and spew out over the sides. Whereas if you're doing it without the glue line, you can, obviously you're applying your own epoxy so you can sort of work out how much to apply, where to apply it and stuff like that. It's more work, but I like, I prefer to do it that way because it's easier. Now, the other element, though, as well, with you know, if we're talking about maybe a transition boot where we've got our main branch of the harness coming in, maybe two, three, five branches coming out the other side of that, is it still important to use a, a epoxy installed manually as well at the outlet of that transition to to properly seal? Because obviously, if you're using a, a glue lined boot, that's great. It's going to have glue on the outside of our, our harness branching, but that leaves the inside, which is still open and allows dirt and, and moisture ingress potentially to occur. Yeah, essentially. So when you have all of the different uh, branches breaking out of a breakout, you'll have a gap between them. So what you want to do is you'll apply the epoxy down in there, shrink the boot over it, and then get the outside. And then what we do is apply like what I call it a trim glue. So essentially, once it's all shrunk down and solid, you apply the epoxy around the edge so that it almost not pots the transition, but puts a nice cap on it and allows everything to be fully sealed and 
all, it all flows in all the gaps then and you know that everything is fully sealed. In other words, getting the the main the key benefits out of the, the work that we've put into building a harness at this level. Uh, now, the other part of that question was the, the lipped versus non-lipped boots. So give, it, give us a bit of a rundown on those. Uh, so yeah, lipped generally means that there's a lip inside of the boot which is for, um, so like when you have an autosport connector, you have a little ridge and then that lip sits in the ridge to stop it sliding back either when you're recovering it or when it's recovered and it reheats and goes a bit soft, it can't then pull or slide off of the back of the connector. Okay, so it's just a, an additional retention mechanism over and above the, the epoxy or glue. That's it, yeah, basically. Okay. All right, let, let's move on. And I wanted to talk a little bit about your business before we finish off. So Level Motorsport Wiring and, and Motorsport Shop. So you know, how, how long have you been in business at this point? Give us a sense of the, the size and scale of, of your operation. So non-officially, we started in 2020, just as COVID hit. and then offic- Perfect timing. Exactly, yeah. Um, and then officially, we actually made the business legitimate in 2021. So the business is technically out. I've been doing it for two years, but the business is only about a year old. So at the minute, we have one employee and myself. So it's me that does all the uh, actual work and wiring and stuff like that. And then my partner helps out. She does actually tr- uh, do some wiring sometimes if I need help, but she generally does all the admin and the managerial stuff. Okay. There's a few things I want to sort of dive into here. What uh, were you doing prior to sort of making that that leap of faith and, and starting your own business? Was this still in the sort of the automotive diagnostics, et cetera, or had you sort of moved on? Was the summer interim? Because we haven't sort of covered that. Yeah. So I actually tried my hand at making a performance shop. So as a part of the family business, I tried to move into doing performance stuff uh, and then decided that I just don't really like working on cars all that much. And uh, <laughs> Uh, dealing with the uh, types of cars and customers that comes with that so we I decided I was just going to double down on what I actually wanted to do and really really had a passion for and then that's how we transitioned into this okay services offered purely just wiring were you also supplying hardware generally we tend to just stay on the wire inside of things um, we are getting into now sort of supplying more stuff just because customers are coming to us with blank canvas builds and allowing us to suggest or uh, recommend to them what we should put on the build. Um, So we generally started supplying a bit of electronics, generally ECU master stuff at the minute, but we're trying to um, push towards more of the higher end stuff. Okay. What have been the challenges, if any, with with starting this, this operation? just time and money and just generally not enough hours in the day for how much work that generally comes in I find at the minute. I mean that's probably not a, a bad thing uh, in terms of making sure that you've got enough work to, to keep you going often that that's the problem with a, a business that's just starting out is, is actually getting customers so it sounds like that that side of things uh, isn't a problem. Yeah. A, in terms of the, the financial element do you take on any investment for this or are you sort of bootstrapping it yourself? No so we literally started with pretty much nothing um, an empty bank account and then just tried to do as many jobs as we could to build up a a decent pot and then work from that. (laughs) Fair enough. And and in terms of getting those customers through the door, what's been the main driver in your marketing or advertising? Instagram has been the primary source of our customer base. Instagram is where we probably do most of our DMs and interactions and get most of our customers from. We don't really advertise other than posting on social media so other than instagram and word of mouth we don't really get any other traffic and it's great that uh, a platform like instagram has become a, a really valid and viable marketing solution for a business like yours and as i already mentioned i mean that that's how how we ended up finding out about you and, and following along the journey as well so i mean obviously that's working I and mean, the fact that the likes of yourself the likes of joel from raceback which we've already talked about are providing this information and i mean probably 95 percent of people following you or seeing your your work on instagram probably aren't going to reach out and actually get you to do work for them the other five percent great they're going to become customers perfect but i think the other element that's really important is just the inspiration that you offer to people that you may never even hear from i think that that's valuable to help inspiring others and just pushing people to to improve themselves and and work at a higher level 
Now, a question that I, I like to ask to business owners, and this is sort of something that is easy to ignore when you're thinking about starting a business about something you're passionate with, like motorsport wiring, you know, that's well and good, but there's a whole lot of other elements that go into running a successful business that, that isn't hands on the tools, actually physically constructing harnesses. Now, is that solely handed off to your partner so you can spend all of your time doing what you enjoy and what you're good at, or is it still an element of time? that you have to spend on the the sort of admin side of the business uh, when we first started there was quite a lot of time that we had to put in to actually set up the business but now it's generally other than actually dealing with customers and dealing with the inquiries i try to get my partner to do most of the admin stuff so i'm free to do other stuff now perfect it sounds like you're growing and getting busier. I did see a while back, I think on your Instagram, that you were looking for outside help in terms of bringing in another employee. How, how's that gone? Have you, have you been able to find anyone suitable? And what are your plans for expansion and growth? So yeah, at the minute, we're, um, we're just with the state of the the world at the minute. We're just taking it a bit of a, a everything with a bit of caution, but um the overall goal is to expand the business and grow as much as we can. So eventually we will be looking to employ people to do the same job and build the business higher. Um, at the minute, we sort of we, we were in a period where we were going to hire, but at the minute we're sort of just waiting out to see what's going to happen. And then we'll probably start to look hiring again, depending on what happens at the minute. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it is a, a fairly uh, unusual economic time all around the world at the moment and a lot of uncertainty. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense to be a little bit cautious, particularly when you are still relatively fresh. In terms of getting staff to do what you do, though, this, this could potentially be problematic given that uh, there isn't really a formal qualification path that turns someone into a professional motorsport wiring harness construction technician. So how do you go about finding someone? Are you looking to employ from other existing similar businesses or would you put someone through uh, your own in-house training sort of scheme to get them up to speed and make sure they're doing the job at the level you want? So a lot of the applications when we were trying to find someone were people from other wiring companies. So some of the bigger companies like Renvale and HCI, a couple more. But the, the generally the problem we found with people from those bigger um, companies is because they take them from not knowing anything right up to being able to build a fully professional harness. We generally find that they only teach them a certain part of the equation. So they're essentially assembly technicians. They're, they can build a really good, nice harness. But when it comes to giving them a blank canvas car and can you go and plan and document and design the harness for that car, you'll find a lot of them don't actually have any experience in that area. So it, it, especially when our business is a smaller business and we have to do all of those roles, it find it becomes a bit harder to be able to find anybody. Yeah. So you actually need someone with a, a broader skill set than just being able to follow construction, uh, a construction plan and and build the harness out. You actually need the the other part of that, which is the the understanding of the fundamentals of what you're dealing with, and then being able to do the design work from scratch. Yes, essentially. All right. Well, hopefully when it does come time to to hire again, you will be able to find uh, the right person. Uh, we've we've been looking and, and it is difficult, particularly on this side of the world, but we, we do wish you all the best on that front. I think we'll, we'll move into wrapping this chat up now, Matt, and uh, we like to finish all of our podcasts with the same three questions that we ask all of our guests, and in the first of those, and maybe we've talked a little bit about this already, but uh, we'll see if we can go a bit deeper. First of those is, what's next in the future for you and Level Motorsport Wiring? So essentially at the minute, we're um, just focusing on putting out really good work and focusing on providing a really good service for our customers. Um, we are hopefully going to try and grow the business to be on a similar sort of level as some of the bigger companies that's sort of my end goal eventually yeah makes sense yeah well you've got to have something to strive for and yeah that's an admirable goal next question uh, is there any advice you'd give to a younger version of yourself or for that matter those listening to help fast track where you've got to in your career and maybe avoid any possible pitfalls that you've come across i don't really know about pitfalls it's more i think if you're passionate about about it and you know that 
or that you think you could do a really good job or you know that you could do a really good job of it and you want to focus on it, I would just jump in and have a go. Just get just get started, really. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of analysis paralysis that goes into our decision making and you know I, i've i've been in a situation myself where i've i've sort of been considering a particular path or a direction for way longer than i probably should have been and then when you finally commit and and go down that path you sort of think to yourself well why didn't i do that a year or or two years earlier i mean obviously i'm not advising here to sort of you know throw caution to the wind and and dive in feet first some some level of of planning and analysis is required but i think our our human sort of uh, go to is to over analyze and sit there um, paralyzed by potential fear the other point that you've made there as well is the passion element, and and I think that that just can't be overstated enough. I, I've I've talked about this in numerous interviews on this podcast already, but you know we, we're going to spend the, the largest portion of our life uh, working in in some some form. So you know if you can be doing something that you're actually passionate about and enjoying, uh, first of all, you're you're in a, a very unique situation. You're in the minority and and that's just going to make uh, everything that you do so much more satisfying. So I, I don't I don't think we can overstate that enough. Our last question for today, Matt, if people want to follow you and see what you're up to, how are they best to do so? Yeah, so um, we actually, I'm pretty pretty sure we're on all of the social medias at the minute. So Instagram is at a level MSW underscore. Um, we have a separate Instagram, which is our shop page, which is LMSW shop. And then we're on all of the say, other platforms, which is TikTok, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, under pretty much all of the same name. Perfect. Or we'll put some uh, links in the show notes to all of those accounts as well. So people will find it super easy to get in touch. Look, Matt, it's been great chatting and we really enjoyed learning about your story and we wish you all the best for the future. I appreciate it. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of Tuned In with Matt, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience and that in turn helps us to continue to get more high quality guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt anywhere in the world free of charge. Also, this is a great place to ask any questions you might have too and I'll do my best to answer them here if your review gets picked. Big shout out to Luke from Australia who has said, automotive knowledge from the best of the best in the business. I've listened to every episode multiple times as there's so much to unpack. The variety of automotive discussions gets me keen to try everything. Hopefully I'll be at the top of my game one day and breaking records and you'll be calling me up for a chat. Luke's also got a question. He has asked, have you ever found a solid solution to eliminate the wastegate flutter noise that occurs with the wastegate opening? I found changing the hertz of the solenoid itself changes the pace, but is this something I can do when building or setting it up to avoid it? It's a good question, Luke. It does tend to be a problem with wastegate boost control solenoids. Uh, as you've already found yourself, changing the frequency that the solenoid operates at is probably the key element. I've found it really comes down to a combination between the duty cycle that we're operating the solenoid at as well as the frequency that it's operating at. Obviously the duty cycle really comes down to how much boost we're requesting but generally as a rough rule of thumb I've found that increasing the solenoid frequency does help to eliminate that sort of chatter noise that we tend to get or oscillation that we tend to get from the wastegate. Uh, the key really to this though is that this only occurs or is only noticeable if our wastegate is venting to atmosphere. Here in New Zealand, with very few exceptions, we now legally must have our wastegate plumbed back into the exhaust. So this is not something that's really been forefront of my mind for some time. But really, my answer there, play around with the frequency, generally around about sort of 20 to about 35, 40 hertz is, is about the range that you'll probably want to have your solenoid in. I'd try a variety of those frequencies and just see if one of them in particular reduces that noise. Anyway, look, thanks for your comments there. And if you get in touch with us with your t-shirt size and shipping details, we'll fire a fresh tea straight out to you. 
All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course you'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses important to mention that when you purchase a course from us that course is yours for life as well it never expires you can rewatch the course as many times as you like whenever you like the purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership that gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.